it's um, well welcome. I do things like this. Um, so that's uh, pretty brief, isn't it? And it's really good to be here. Um, I come uh, from uh, a town called Bournemouth down in the south of England. I studied just across uh, country in Edinburgh uh, 10 years ago now. Um, but it's good to be back in Scotland this week. And um, uh, welcome, and particularly if this is your first time. Uh, as we said, we have about 20 minutes, then we'll have time for questions. Please feel free to text in as we go through. And it may well be that you've um, got questions that relate to some of the talks we've already done this week. Uh, well, if you go on the Facebook Uncover group, um, you'll see links to all of the talks, both lunch times and evenings. And so you can go on there if you've missed any and um, check out uh, what you could have heard um, on that. Um, but you're here today and we're going to be looking in this first session um, at how can there be only one way to God. In our culture at the moment, one of the biggest buzzwords going around is the word tolerance for lots of different reasons. Um, the idea that we should be tolerant of everyone, no matter what they do, no matter what they think, no matter what they believe. Tolerance is a hugely important thing in our culture. And in, because of that, I would say, and in the light of that, Christianity seems to be very intolerant. Because right at the heart of the Christian claim is a Jesus who says that he is the only way to God. Which immediately makes us ask questions. What about all the other religions? What are we to make of them? This is uh, Leicester, where I grew up. Uh, it was the first city in Britain to have an ethnic majority, uh, meaning more people from non-English backgrounds. And so because of that, loads of different religious groups uh, found uh, within my city. Now, how can you say that all of these people are wrong? Isn't that intolerant and exclusive and bigoted? How can you claim that there is only one truth? Or as a friend of mine put it, or sorry, as a uh, student uh, friend of mine put it, she said, I accept everyone, no matter what they believe. Why can't you, as a Christian? Uh, and why can't God, um, even more importantly? So it's very popular to say, it doesn't really matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what religious convictions you hold, they're all <laughs> equally true, they're all equally valid, provided you're sincere. And provided you don't force them upon me, uh, that's okay. So that's a very popular view. And just to begin with, let me, let me just say four things by way of introduction that maybe call us into question that, that view and makes us think it through a little bit. Firstly, and what is the evidence for that belief? Now I've chosen the word belief quite deliberately because actually when you say all religions are equally true or all religions are equally valid, you are in fact stating a belief. You're believing something about religions. And my question would be, what is your basis for that? Why do you believe that? It's popular, and it's nice to believe that, but is it true? And is there a reason to believe it? I'm always told as a Christian, you shouldn't just believe it because it's popular or because it's you know, nice. You should believe it if it's true. Now, what's the evidence for that belief that all religions are equally valid? Is there such, or is it just a nice idea? Because there are lots of people in the world that don't agree with that. Uh, probably, maybe a majority of the world's population wouldn't necessarily agree with that belief. So why should you think you're right and they're wrong? Um, Alvin Plantinga, a Christian philosopher from the States, was once in a debate with a religious pluralist, uh, someone who believes that all religions are basically the same and equally valid. And this guy said to Alvin Plantinga, um, if you were born in Morocco, you wouldn't be a Christian. And Alvin Plantinga said, yes, and if you were born in Morocco, you wouldn't be a religious pluralist. See, there are lots of people in the world who just don't even get this whole idea that all religions are the same. So why should we think that our view has to be right and Trump's theirs? Here's the second thing. Um, when we say that all religions are basically the same, it ignores some of the very real differences between religions. Um, you don't need to have studied RE to any great length at school to know that there are differences between religions. So there are very fundamental questions of, you know, does God exist? Um, and what is God like? And how many gods are there? People say religions are superficially different and fundamentally similar, but when you start to look at it, it would appear that actually they're fundamentally different and only superficially similar. And I may be the illustration that is popularly used as the illustration of the elephants. Um, this was uh, often um, trotted out. Is an elephant trot plodded out? I don't know. Um, in my religious education classes at school. 
And I was told, basically, religious people and religions are like blind people feeding an elephant. And what they're doing is they're trying to grasp ultimate reality. But they're blind, and so they don't quite get it right. One person feels its side and says it's a brick wall. Another person feels its leg and says it's a tree trunk. Another person feels its tail and says it's a rope. And we'll stop with the body parts there, maybe. Um, but, but they're all feeling the different parts of the elephant. And they say, well, that's, that's what religion is like. There's a couple of problems, at least, with that illustration. I don't know if you spotted them. Firstly, it's quite an arrogant illustration. You see, who is it in the illustration that claims to be able to see? And it's the person that's giving the illustration. The person giving the illustration says, I have seen what everyone else hasn't seen. All the religious people in the world are blind people grasping at reality, but I've got the secret. I've got the answer. It's quite arrogant, isn't it, for someone who's claiming to say something quite humble. There's another problem with it, and that is, they weren't all right. They were actually all wrong. Because it wasn't a brick wall, or a tree trunk, or a rope. It was an elephant. They were barking completely up the wrong tree, or elephants, you might say. You see, they were all wrong. There are differences, fundamental differences, between religion, and it's naive. And I think sometimes condescending towards religions of any sort to say they're basically all the same. Because they're just not. Here's the third thing to, to bear in mind. To be tolerant, to exercise tolerance, means, by definition, that you disagree with someone. And this is very often misunderstood in our society. We're told to be tolerant of all people, and I would say that's a good thing. Christianity has a lot to say and advocate for tolerance, that we should accept people of other beliefs, um, other ideas, um, and we should give them the freedom to do that. Tolerance is good, but tolerance presupposes that you disagree with someone. Because if you agree with them, you don't need to tolerate them. You agree with them, okay? Tolerance is what you need when you don't agree with someone, when you think they're wrong, but you allow them the freedom to hold that belief. Okay? And so tolerance, by its very definition, allows for the fact that you might think that someone else isn't actually right. <coughs> and then here's the fourth thing. You can't get away from exclusivity, no matter how hard you try. I mean, you're all, all here at the University of Glasgow, which is an exclusive establishment. They don't let anybody into it. Okay? Um, now, how you got into it is another matter. Sorry. Uh, I'm sure you got into it because you're very, very intelligent. But, but it's an exclusive establishment. You had to pass exams. You got in. Exclusivity is part and parcel of life. It's also part and parcel of truth. Um, to make truth claims is to make exclusive claims, no matter what they are. But let me try and explain. Every view, I think, about religion is ultimately exclusive. They were basically the four views about religion that you might have. You probably all fit into one of these categories, don't you? Firstly, there are some people who say all religions are right. doesn't matter what you believe, they're all correct, if you believe it. Secondly, some people say only some religions are right. And you know, we'll exclude a few of the wacky or crazy ones, and we'll pick the ones we like. Other people say, no, only one religion is right. And it's, well, you can fill in the blank, whatever you think it is. And other people say, no, this... No religions that are right at all, they're all wrong. There is no God, there is no supernatural, religion is wrong, it's bad. So four views, all, some, one, none. You've pretty much got to fit into one of those categories, haven't you? Now, people often say, how exclusive is view number three? How exclusive to say there is only one right religion? But, have you thought about it? All of those views are exclusive. If you're saying that all religions are right, you're saying that the people who say that some of them, one of them, and none of them are right, are wrong. If you say that only some of the religions are right, you're saying the people who say that all of them are right, one of them are right, or none of them are right, are wrong, and so on. You get the point? Whatever your opinion about religion, whether you want to include them all or exclude them all, you're always going to be exclusive. That's the nature of truth. You can't get away from it. It's not just Christianity that is making exclusive claims. Everybody makes exclusive claims, and that's okay. The real question we want to ask is this. What is the basis of the claims that are being made? And are there reasons for accepting or rejecting them? Rather than just saying, all religions are the same, they're all true. Actually, are there religions, or is there a religion that's true? And is there good reasons for accepting them, or one of them? Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, how do I respond to this? 
Some of you might be sitting here saying, well, to be honest, this is just too confusing. Just forget it. Doesn't really matter. I don't care. But actually, I would suggest that if the last few years of our world's history tells us anything, it's that what we believe really does matter because beliefs have consequences. So this question of what is true and the implications of what we believe is important. It might be that you're saying, um, well, okay, what I'll do is I'll study all world religions and then I'll make up my mind. And you're absolutely free to do that. As a Christian, I've got nothing against you doing that at all. The only practical problem, of course, that you have is that there are quite a lot of religions out there. And if you're going to study them all in depth before you make up your mind where you're going to jump, as it were, you're going to be spending a long time. And spending a long time doing it because there's just a lot to look into. Well, there's a third option. And the third option is you can start with Christianity. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, of course you would say that. You're part of the Christian union. You're bound to say that. Well, of course I am. I am slightly biased in that regard. But can I give you another reason? But in fact, can I give you three reasons why I think starting with the claims of Christianity would actually be a helpful place to start, not just because um, I'm working with the CU here. Three reasons why I think starting with the claims of Jesus is a good place to start. Firstly, because I think you can show that Christianity is a unique in a way that you can't, it's so true in a way that you can't with any other religion. It's unique in the way you can investigate it. Now, what do I mean by that? How do you know whether a religion is true or not? It's a good question, isn't it? And one of the problems we have is that it's very hard, often, to show whether a religion is true. Because most religions are philosophies or sets of moral teachings. And so it's hard to say they are objectively true or false, because there is no way in which you could falsify them or objectively verify them. You can say, I like it or I dislike it, but you can't say it's true <coughs> or false. In Buddhism, for instance, you may like it, you may dislike it, but whether or not Buddha existed doesn't really make any difference to Buddhism because it's a philosophy, a set of teaching. Um, or take Islam, for instance, the claim that Muhammad went into a cave, received the words of Allah, which are now written down as the Quran. Now, how do you know if that's true, other than reading the Quran? Well, it'd be very hard, wouldn't it? No one else is in the cave, no one else is there to verify it. There's nothing really that you could objectively verify to say this is true or false. It's not verifiable in that sense. But when it comes to Christianity, I would suggest there is a difference here. Christianity is, is founded on Christ. I mean, the clue is in the name, isn't it? Someone said if you take Christ out of Christian, you're left with three letters, I-A-N and Ian can't help you. And they were right, okay? Christianity is about Christ. It's based on him, not just on his teaching, but on his person, because Jesus' teaching centered on himself. He didn't point away from himself, but pointed to himself. And he said that his claims were verified by what he did, and fundamentally by his death and his resurrection. And so in the first century, when Christianity began to grow, it was based on and founded on this claim that their leader had died and risen again. And they were quite public about it. Now, what difference does that make? Because Christianity isn't just a teaching, a philosophy or an idea, but about a person and about an event, <laughs> the resurrection, it is something you can investigate. That's why often Christianity has been open to so much critical investigation, because it can be. And the question is, will you take the time to investigate it? Because you can. Um, you can ask your questions. You can look at the evidence historically for the reliability of the Bible, for the claim of the resurrection. You can do the work. Now, I know most of you might be thinking, OK, well, it's rubbish. There is no evidence. But actually, I would say there is. Have you taken the time to look into it? Of course, if you never take the time, you'll never be convinced. But if you were willing to look into it, you might be. And there's a book at the back called The Case for Christ, which you could read and look through. And it looks at the evidence for Jesus um, and the historical evidence for the resurrection. <laughs> you can come tomorrow night and you can listen to the talk on the resurrection where we're going to look at the evidence for it. Now you say, well, that's biased. You're a Christian and the book's written by a Christian. Well, sure. But if I was going to make up my mind on atheism, I wouldn't just read books written by Christians, would I? That would be naive. That would be a bit kind of strange. So if you're going to make up your mind on the claims of Jesus, read something written by someone who's been convinced by it and see what you make of the evidence. So that's the first thing. But here's the second thing. Jesus is unique in what he claims about himself. Many religions have religious leaders, 
And many religious leaders have claimed things about themselves, that they are prophets, that they are wise men, that they are teachers. But actually Jesus, out of all the respective religious leaders of the world, is different. And then actually Jesus wasn't just claiming to speak for God, but he was claiming to speak as God. He was claiming to be God. And again and again we see him doing things and saying things that only God could rightly do. He claims to forgive sin, something that people knew was only the right of God to do. He accepts people's worship, which even angels in the Bible were not allowed to do. He claimed the very name of God, the I Am, Yahweh, for himself, repeatedly. And he said that God the Father and himself were one and the same thing. Jesus was claiming to be God. And if that's true, I had a chance of being true, that means that Jesus' claim about himself is unique. It also means that when Jesus speaks, he speaks of a unique authority. He's not just guessing what God might be like, but he's speaking as God. So it would be worth listening to what he has to say. But here's the third thing. Why check out Christianity? Firstly, it's unique in the way you can investigate it. Secondly, it's unique in what it claims about its founder. Thirdly, it's unique in what it offers. I guess most of us assume we understand what religion is all about. Religion is basically different ways of following rules, regulations, and living your life in order that God, if there is one, might accept you, and if the afterlife, if there is one, might be good rather than bad. Okay? So good people get in, bad people are out. And the standard of goodness is dependent on the rules of your particular religion. Earn the spiritual brownie points, you'll be okay. And those of us that are not religious are probably slightly suspicious of that for various reasons, partly because we see what that might lead to. If the good are in and the bad are out, what might that lead to? Two things. Firstly, it might lead to pride. You see, if good people are in and bad people are out, and I think I'm in, it's because I think I'm better than you. And how dare you claim that you're better than me? Or it might be that actually I end up despairing, because if good people are in and bad people are out, what if I don't think I'm good enough? What if I look at my life and I see the rubbish and the mess there and think, what hope is there? So there's two consequences, possibly. Pride or despair. Either way, I'm going to be a pain in the next most of you, aren't I? As we're suspicious of religious claims. But again, this is where what Jesus offers is so unique. Religion often works on this system of karma. You get what you deserve. But Jesus talks about something called grace, which is totally the opposite. In fact, that you get what you don't deserve. Religion says, do. Observe rules and God will accept you. Jesus says, it's what I do for you that really matters. He says, I haven't come to give you rules. I've come to live the life you should have lived. I'm going to die the death you should have died. And I am going to make it possible, not through your own religious observance, but through what I have done for you to be accepted by me. Simply by receiving my forgiveness, the offer of my grace, you can have this acceptance that I promise. It's so different. It's totally upside down. It's so unique. In fact, it's so unique that in the first century, Christianity was not even regarded as a religion because it was so different in the claims that it was making. This is not about religious observance. Now, if that is true, what is the consequence of such a view? Well, if religion can lead to pride or despair, what would grace lead to? And I suggest quite the opposites. Firstly, it should lead to humility. You see, the first step to becoming a Christian is not to think you're better than everyone else, but actually it's to realise that you're not. In fact, it's one of the reasons why people often find it so hard to come to Jesus, because the first thing you have to do is to admit that you need forgiveness. So Christians walking around being arrogant would be a complete oxymoron, because, hey, to become a Christian I have to realise my need of forgiveness. And I continually need it. It leads to humility, but it also leads to joy. Because even though I know I'm not the person I should be, even though I know that in my own right and in my own standing there's no way that God should accept me, I am accepted because of Jesus. I have joy, a liberating joy and a freedom that means that I can live my life knowing that I am and will be accepted by God, not because I've been good enough, but because he has done enough for me. Not pride, not despair, but joy, humility. That's what grace is. It's so different. Check out the Christians here at the university and say, what do I make of these guys? Do they look like they're morally superior bigots who are looking down their nose at me because they're morally better than I am? 
Or are they just joyful people who've received something amazing, this offer of forgiveness? And actually, therefore, maybe your fear of getting involved with Jesus because you think it's going to make you feel that you've got a morally superior is unfounded because you won't have to. It's not something that you have to sign up to at all. Uh, let me just say this um, before we have questions. Um, if you're thinking, yeah, but, but Christianity is still exclusive, isn't it? I mean, you're still saying Jesus is the only way. Well, here it is and here it isn't. <laughs> what do I mean? Jesus did say he was the only way. Not because he was wanting to exclude people. No, no, not at all. In fact, Jesus said that his coming into the world was not to condemn anyone, but actually so that people could be rescued. But Jesus said he's the only way because actually it's only through his death that the problem of our sin and our wrong can be dealt with. If religious observance was enough, if going to church or going to a mosque or going to a temple was enough, then Jesus didn't need to come. His death was unnecessary. But Jesus said actually the problem is that's not enough. It doesn't bring us forgiveness. It doesn't bring us the transformation we need. Only my death and resurrection can. But then he says, this offer is open to everyone. You know, how do you receive the gift of Jesus' forgiveness? Do you have to change your culture? No. Do you have to change your clothing? No, although some Christians like to wear weird clothes. It doesn't have to be the case for you, okay? You don't. You need to receive a gift. That's what it means to accept Christ, receive his forgiveness. And there are millions around the world that have done that. In fact, 70,000 a day, the statisticians say, will do that. And do you know where people are doing this the most? Where the church is growing the most in the world today? Is it in a Western country? No. The two countries with the fastest church growth today are Iran and Afghanistan. You see, the church is open for all, no matter what your cultural background. Because it's not a cultural construct. It's about Jesus and about his gift of forgiveness. And I think that's just beautiful and wonderful. That's why we're on about it this week. Now listen, I'm guessing um, people are thinking different things. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, look, just shut up, Otzi. Um, <laughs> go back to England. I, you know, I don't buy it, okay? All this stuff, don't even think it's true. Well, thank you for listening, okay, first of all. Thank you for, for at least um, giving me 20 minutes. But before you write this off as just rubbish, can I just challenge you to do one thing? Can I challenge you to look into it for yourself? Um, take away the book that's on your um, chairs, or at least it was uh, before you sat on it, um, called Uncover. And that's an account of Jesus' life. Check out Jesus, because as I said, Christianity is about him. Look into what he is like. Look into who he is. Read it for yourself. At least you'll be able to know what it is you've rejected at very least. Don't just make up your mind on it because everyone else says so. But it might be actually that you're not cynical like that. You are wanting to find out more. Well, as well as all the events that we've been putting on this week, what you'll find really helpful is a course called Uncover. It's going to start uh, next week. It's going to go through that little book. It's going to give you the opportunity to bring your questions, uh, investigate the evidence, um, raise your doubts, but look into who Jesus is and what difference that would make to you. We'd love you to come to it. I think you'd find it really, really helpful. And hey, even if what I had to say today just had a small chance of being true, wouldn't it be worth investigating it to find out? Because the stakes are big. Um, the implications are massive. Okay. So, we're going to go to questions. Um, and whilst we're having the questions, please do be filling out the feedback form. Um, you can all leave us your comments about the lunch, about the talk and everything else. Um, there's a pen provided so you can do that. And if you would like to come to that course, and I would urge you to do it, if you've not made up your mind yet on Jesus, um, and if you've not investigated it, then tick the box that says tell me more and leave us your name and number. And we'll give you a ring um, within the next 24 hours and we'll let you know where and when that course is going to be. Okay? So leave us your comments um, and that would be great. And then name and number um, and tick the box um, and we'll tell you about the Uncover course. And then someone will be at the door as you leave to pop them in. Now we've got 10 minutes and we do want time for questions. Have we got questions already? Great. We've got one on the text. Keep texting. Oh, yeah. yeah, please text in if you haven't already. Um, the number's still up there. Um, the first one is, nine million children die each year before the age of five. What is their fate considering most of their parents are praying to their own God? Great, thank you so much um, for that question. Because um, it's a very big question. Um, uh, I've got friends whose children died in infancy as well, and it raises very, very emotional questions, very uh, real questions. Um, for people, not just a statistic, but you know, their children. What is um, the fate in that situation? 
The Bible doesn't exactly give us the answer um, to that question, um, but I think it does give us some clues. Firstly, it tells us that God is just and fair, and therefore I don't think God will judge someone for not making a decision they were incapable of doing. For instance, a child who wasn't capable of even responding um, to this offer of forgiveness. And so I don't think on the Day of Judgment anyone's going to be saying to God, actually that wasn't fair. In fact, there does seem to be a passage, a story in the Old Testament that gives us a clue of, of this, towards this, because there was a king called David whose baby died in infancy. And he grieved, obviously, very naturally for the loss of his child. But then he said this, he said, he, the baby, will not return to me, but, but one day I will go to him. And so he had this hope that actually he would see this child again one day. And I think um, we can trust in a God who is just um, to be fair in the way that he deals. And a child who's not able to comprehend, understand or respond to this message of forgiveness, I don't think God will judge them for not doing that um, when they were unable to do it. Now, none of us are children. Um, all of us have had the opportunity to make up our minds. So we're not in that situation, are we? And it is up to us to decide, okay, how are we going to respond to what we have heard? And the Bible does clearly say that. We're accountable for what we know. Um, those that have more opportunity um, have obviously got to, to be accountable for that. Um, that's why Jesus said to the people who he had lived amongst and done his miracles amongst, that for them it was even more serious because they had lived and seen and witnessed his miracles and yet they'd still rejected him, willfully and objectively. Um, he said actually there were other people who hadn't had that opportunity. And actually for them, the situation was different. So I think that's um, important to remember. But good question, thank you. Another one came in there. Um, would karma not promote a more responsible way of life rather than grace, regardless of actions? Yeah, great question. And um, uh, so two issues there. So firstly, does karma promote a better way of life rather than grace? Because karma would say, well, at least you should do good things with the motivation that you might get good things. Whereas grace, if I know I'm accepted by God, then it doesn't matter what I do. So I can just be irresponsible, go around you know, cheat, murder, lie, whatever, um, God's going to accept me. Two misunderstandings. The first is a misunderstanding about karma, and the second is a misunderstanding about grace. Um, firstly, if you go to certain parts of the world where karma is very ingrained in the psyche, um, the outworking of this doesn't always lead positively. Sometimes, I put possibly it does, but, but not always. Um, a friend of mine was working in um, East Asia, um, in a country where the idea of karma was very prevalent. And he was working with an organisation there and a number of his colleagues and their children were in a minibus that crashed. And most of them were killed. Some of them died um, after the accident um, and some of them in hospital. But they said one of the incredible things was when this minibus crash happened is that there were bodies obviously lying around on the, on the roads. And the interesting thing was the lack of people's response to go and help. Why? And if you pushed it, the realisation for a lot of people was actually those people were receiving what they deserved for their bad karma. And if I get involved and try and help them, then maybe I will stop them from taking what they deserve and also that bad karma might come onto me. So karma isn't always, I would say, such a good thing. Secondly, I would also say, I think it's also a misunderstanding about grace. The Bible says we're not accepted because of what we do, uh, but because of what Jesus has done. But when we come to know that acceptance of Jesus, that will change our lives. Put it this way, religion says, obey and you will be accepted. Christianity says, you are accepted because of Jesus, now obey. Now start to live differently. And Jesus says it's by the fruit that you'll recognise a Christian, by the fruit of their lives. Not they are doing things to get you know, a better afterlife but as a grateful response for what they've already received, which I would suggest is a good thing. Do you know why? Because it means that when a Christian is doing a good thing, it's not because they've got vested interest in trying to get to heaven. They already know they're going to heaven. It's because they're simply responding gratefully to a God who's already given them so much. So the charge that religious people are just being selfish in doing their good things so they get a good result can't actually be levelled at a Christian who believes in grace because... They aren't doing it for anything they're going to get because they've already got everything they could get freely and they're simply doing it out of response to that. 
Next question. Um, can we expect those in spiritually repressed, repressed countries to convert to Christianity? Right, again, another really good question. And um, big issue, because there are obviously lots of people in lots of countries in the world that don't have the same access <laughs> to, to Christianity that we do. Um, uh, there are universities in the world where it would not be legal to, to just have an open discussion like this. Um, so what about people in those situations? Again, the Bible doesn't answer explicitly everything that we might like to know about that. That's because the Bible gives us everything we need to know, not everything we might like to know. And for us, it's always going to be a hypothetical question, because we can hear. And if you're asking the question, it's always going to be hypothetical, because you've heard. But what does the Bible say? Two things, and if you look in the book of Romans in the New Testament, in the first two chapters, it tells us two things that everyone in the world does know. Firstly, that everyone in the world can know something of God's existence and character through the creation of the world that's been made. And secondly, that everyone can know something about God's standards through our internal conscience that God has given us. Now that's not precise and exact, and we don't know everything there is to know about God through that, but they are two things that everyone has in the world that can show us something, which is why there's never been a culture that's been discovered that's purely and completely atheistic and naturalistic. Every culture has had some sense of the supernatural, and every culture has had some sense of morality. Now, of course, the question is, how do I respond to that? If I can know that there might be a God and that actually I might not be good enough for him, I could do two things. One, I could rely upon my own efforts, religious or otherwise, to make myself good enough. Or I could recognize that those efforts, no matter how hard I try, are never enough. And I could trust in God to be gracious to me. Now, could it be that God could apply to someone the work and forgiveness of Jesus, who hasn't explicitly heard about Jesus, but is trusting in God to be gracious, not knowing exactly how that might be? Possibly. I say I have to be slightly agnostic because the Bible doesn't explicitly answer it. But I would go back to why I said God is utterly just. And it does seem that God takes into account the opportunities that people have had to hear and respond to the message of Jesus. So we can trust God to be just in those situations. Certainly there were people before Jesus who didn't know what we know about Jesus, but were looking forward in hope for what God would do. And we know that they were genuinely accepted by God, many of them, because of that hope they had in what God would do in the future. So that doesn't explicitly and completely answer the question. I think it does help me think that there are many reasons here to be hopeful and also trust in God's fairness in this. But like I said, for us it is a hypothetical question, isn't it? Because we can investigate. And just because other people don't have the opportunity that you do, don't let that stop you making the most of it. I remember once being in a discussion group and a lady said to me, she said, I could never become a Christian because there are people in the world that haven't had the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And another girl in the group herself, she wasn't a Christian, but she just thought about it, and she said, but hang on a minute, if you were sick, wouldn't you go to hospital? This lady said, of course I would. She said, but isn't that unfair, considering there are lots of people in the world that don't have the same access to healthcare that we do? That would be stupid, wouldn't it, to cut yourself off from the offer of what you've been given, simply because other people haven't had the same offer. Wouldn't it be far better to make sure that you receive it, and also let others know about it? Which is why Christians do like to share what they have, because they think it's good news. We want to make people have the opportunity for themselves, or at least give them the opportunity um, to respond to it too. Brilliant. Good questions. Um, I'm aware it's 10 to.